nonetheless, there was something that uh, a video I came across. Um, some of you may know um, Sister Margaret Davis, and she has compiled uh, and put together a book called What Shall I Do to Inherit Eternal Life? Um, <clears throat> there's a larger volume of that book, and there's a smaller uh, volume. There are two smaller. One's is, one is smaller than the other. There are two, I would say, matter of fact, there are three. The, the, the whole volume is called What Shall I Do to Harry Eternal Life? I, I'm not sure how many volumes there are. But there is, hmm, I believe I, oh, I have one. Yes. I believe I have two of these um, particular books. Thank you. I believe I have two. Um, this one is called, again, What Shall I Do to Inherit Eternal Life? No. This is called What Shall I Do to Inherit Eternal Life by Margaret Davis. Now, again, um, there are two copies of this particular color uh, cover, and one of them is thinner than the other. Uh, and so um, I would recommend you get the thicker one, which is uh, 221 pages. Uh, I'll just leave it here. What Shall I Do to Inherit Eternal Life by Sister Margaret Davis. I've had the opportunity of actually being in one of her uh, seminars uh, that she did in California. And <clears throat> it was a tremendous blessing. Um, and what makes this particular book um, come alive is her experience. What led her uh, to begin to study um, into the subject, the coin phrase of righteousness by faith, which is salvation, which is eternal life. This is what she began to study. And there was an experience that led up to that. And, and in the, the book, in the first part of the book, she kind of goes through what led her to that experience. And so again, if you don't have the book, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recommended uh, read. Again, a compilation of various statements uh, but I believe that um, the framework that they have been put in um, will prove a blessing to you. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of books out there on righteousness by faith uh, that I generally don't recommend. Um, uh, I often or will when someone wants to study the subject of righteousness by faith um, along with their Bibles. Uh, uh, Steps to Christ, Ministry of Healing, Desire of Ages, Christ's Object Lessons, and Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. If you want to, in particular, study that particular subject, um, because righteousness by faith is not an intellectual um, uh, assent to truth. It's not like you are attempting to arrive to a particular theology, but it is an experience of a life that is not bottled up in sermons from a pulpit, um, is not bottled up in Bible studies. It is something that is poured forth in a life that uh, bears witness to the gospel and to the power of Christ being exemplified in our daily acts, whether it be home, um, among the, the children, whether it be in the mission field, whether it be in the grocery store, whether it be on the freeway when others are, are uh, uh, manifesting what is turned, termed road rage, <clears throat> whether it is seen in one's uh, firing or a uh, person being uh, unfairly treated in their jobs, workspace, school, whatever the case may be, their righteousness by faith is exemplified. As a matter of fact, you, when you look at 
the book of Job. As a matter of fact, let's go to Job 29. Job talks about righteousness. And he says that it was something that he put on. Look at Job uh, chapter 29. Uh, Job uh, 29. And he says, uh, Job uh, chapter 29, and look at, let's see, help me to put my eyes. Job 29 in verse 14. Job 29 in verse 14. And again, I want us to, uh, again, as I mentioned, started out a video. Uh, I was watching a, a discussion, uh, listening to a discussion, I should say, of Margaret, Sister Margaret Davis. And she was talking about a preacher uh, during her time who has since uh, then have passed. Uh, but his works are following him, his teachings. And she was talking about a pastor named Morris Vinden. And his understanding of righteousness uh, by faith. Uh, there are others that that uh, along the same uh, sort of line. Uh, Jack Sequeira, what many today may not be aware of. Uh, you have Whelan and uh, Short. Um, all of these individuals, uh, the Righteousness by Faith 1880, 1888 Committee all along this same particular uh, uh, thread of what Margaret Davis was speaking against, of which caused her at that particular time such trouble. And as I listened to that, um, her, uh, um, I guess her heartfelt burden and um, that she had for that teaching that was at that time being that's in books by Morris Vinden and that has become uh, a staple in Adventist preaching today. It troubled her. Um, and she, again, talked about Morris Vending. Um, he was a pastor at PUC at the time and he traveled uh, camp meetings and various places, wrote books uh, uh, upon this subject and it has been grasped and eaten by eager <clears throat> souls that um, and that are, were endeavoring to have victory in their lives and yet grabbed hold of something that would give them an alternative to the strenuous task of trying to have victory in their lives. And so this bypass of Morris Vinden and that particular teaching, again, which goes along with Jack Sequeira, the 1888 uh, committee, uh, it, it is still alive and well. Again, it's become the staple of Adventist uh, preaching. You can hear, uh, you hear it a lot in the preaching of Ty Gibson. Uh, um, um, I don't know about Rafferty, but you hear it in Ty Gibson's teachings. You hear it in uh, David Ashrick teachings, and it, it's, it's prevalent through Adventism. Not to say that they got it from Morris Vending, but the, the same, the concept is prevalent through Adventism. And so, um, as I was listening to that subject, as she was dealing with this, um, it, 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 it reminded me of, again, my own experience of uh, spending time with Sister Davis while she was there in California and also spending time with um, other individuals who um, uh, um, I guess uh, was promoting the, the ideas and the sentiments of Morris Vinden and others uh, believing that they were resurrecting the, the messages of Jones and Wagner um, so, uh, the book, if you've ever seen the book, I don't think I have that book, but if you've ever seen the book Lessons on Faith by 
it was it's a co compiling of sermons by Jones and Wagner. The family that actually put that book together in the 70s, uh, you might have seen a book, 1895, and the sermons of Jones and Wagner on the third angel's message. If you have that book, it starts with sermon, I believe, sermon 11. <clears throat> and the family that compiled those books back in the 70s, I actually had the opportunity to actually sit down with that uh, those that family and and go through these particular things now the for me what happened was while I was studying this subject I could not wrap my mind around I'm sort of jumping but I couldn't wrap my mind around this particular understanding um, and I found out later why because the book Christ Object Lessons and the book Steps of Christ. I had read them, um, not necessarily knowing um, all of I, that I would encounter all these things in, uh, years later, but having read those books, I could not grasp the concept. They were using the Bible and they were using the Spirit of Prophecy quotations, but I could not wrap my mind around the concept that was being promoted. You can take the Bible, you can take the Spirit of Prophecy, and you can put it in a particular uh, um, framework that does not harmonize with context. And so as I listened to the discussion with Sister Margaret Davis concerning Morris Vinden, um, and again, it just reminded me of different things that I've encountered. And I want us tonight to, again, just talk about the idea of what righteousness by faith, what it looks like. And again, not from my perception of it, but again, understanding how God has given this to us. And while it is a precious message, while it does put Christ back in the third angel's message where he belongs and uh, it, 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 it highlights the, the intent and the purpose of the everlasting gospel. As I've said before, when you look at Revelation 14, it is not the gospel and then the first, second, and third angel. The first, second, and third angel is the gospel. It is the gospel in very, it, it, it is an unfolding of what the gospel is. When you look into the gospel, how do you know you're looking at the everlasting gospel? Because these are the components that will be there. These are the ingredients that you will find in the gospel. The gospel, according when Paul says in Galatians, if any man preaches any other gospel, if it does not have this ingredient, these ingredients, let it be accursed. And so how do we know that what we're hearing is the everlasting gospel? We must look at the ingredients. We must make sure that what we're looking at <clears throat> and the order that God has given it, that it, an action, that, that it will accomplish God's purpose for us. Notice what it says, you're on Job 29, Job 29. And look at Job 29, and, and, and Job is recounting an experience. He's being accused of having some sin in his life. He's accused of having violated some principle of God, and therefore these judgments are coming on him as a result of that particular violation. And Job is not boasting, but Job is simply recounting his experience <clears throat> that God has uh, been able to manifest to him. Now notice what it says in Job 29, all right? He talks about uh, uh, different things that he has done. Matter of fact, look at verse 11. It says, when the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish 
came upon me and I caused the widow's hearts heart to sing for joy. Verse 14, I put on righteousness. It wasn't intellectual. It wasn't something he professed. It was something that was demonstrated. And so the, the righteousness that Job put on is the righteousness that God commends in Matthew 25, when he talks about those on his right hand, because those on the left side were professors of righteousness. They, 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 they preached about righteousness by faith. They had Bible studies about righteousness by faith, but they, it was nothing that they could put on. It was nothing to be demonstrated. It was all a intellectual jargon that could not motivate them to, to, to minister to those that God had ordained that those who were saved, they were saved to serve. So those in Matthew 25 on the right side, it was a righteousness that God commended. When you look at James chapter two, there is a righteousness that is commended versus a righteousness that God wants nothing to do with. Show me thy faith without works. That's intellectual. That's Bible studies. That is a disregard for the principles and the standards and the reforms of God. But he says, but I will show thee my faith by my what? Works. Faith without works is dead. What faith? Righteousness by faith is seen by our works. And so what happens is you have a, you have a group of, you have individuals who recognize that there's something that, that, that something in their life is not right. Rich young ruler. Let's take him for an example. Rich young ruler. He saw the work of Christ. He, he witnessed the, the, the love of Christ. He witnessed Christ uh, uh, coming close to the people. He saw that uh, uh, Christ exemplified a love that he had not witnessed before, neither in the church or anywhere. And he was moved as he saw the ministry of Christ, the compassion that Christ had for old and for young for the sick and diseased. And this is what led him to say, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? He longed for something he did not have. He knew within his heart that his profession of religion and even maybe his ceremonial deeds did not bring the peace and the satisfaction that he thought these outwardly deeds would do. And so he's drawn to Christ and he's Lord, good master. Uh, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus now is speaking of a righteousness that he could put on. Jesus is asking the man to become a partaker of his suffering that he may be a partaker of his glory. His man is rich. Jesus was rich. Jesus became poor. Jesus was asking this man to become poor. He was asking the man to become a sharer in his suffering, but the man was more satisfied with an intellectual assent to truth 
than he was in a vital godliness, godlikeness. And so rather than counting the riches of this world like Moses, uh, uh, nothing, and grabbing hold of Christ and casting the world behind and taking up his cross and following Christ, he was more in love with his status in the church. He was more in love with his status. And the Bible says he went away from Christ sorrowful. To do what? To continue in a lifeless form of ceremonial righteousness. And this is what many today have bought into, ceremonial righteousness. They will often uh, uh, grab hold of various trending phrases. And that is, is all about relationship. It's all about a relationship. But if you look at their understanding of a relationship, it is no different from what the evangelicals believe. It's no different from what Catholics uh, uh, believe. It's no different. It's, 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 it's on the same tray, if you will. It's on the same track and it will lead to the same destination, destruction of souls. It's all about a relationship. I want you to notice, I want to read something from the book Evangelism, page 152. Evangelism, page 152. Evangelism, page 152. It's under a section where it says, teach how to become Christians. How do we become like Christ? Just a profession? Just uh, 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 church participation? Is that how we become like Christ? It says, I distinctly, I wish you to distinctly understand this point, that souls are kept from obeying the truth by a confusion of ideas, and also because they do not know how to surrender their wills and their minds to Jesus. They want special instruction how to become Christians. Watch this point again. I wish you to distinctly understand this point, that souls are kept from obeying the truth by a confusion of ideas. Right? It says, and also because they do not know how to surrender their mind, their wills, choice, and their minds to Jesus. They want special instruction on how to become Christian. How do we surrender? the will, the choice, and the mind to Jesus. How do we make that choice? How can we come to the point of continually acknowledging Jesus? How do we come to the point of trusting in the Lord with all our hearts, leaning not to thine own understanding, but in all of our ways of life, we are willing to acknowledge him. How do we come to that point? And what we often may not necessarily examine to the fullest extent it is found right in the Word of God. It's found when John says in John 1.29. Let's go there, brothers and sisters. John 1.29. Notice what it says. John 1.29. Mm. 
Mm. John 1, 29. And I want us to look at what the scriptures tells us there. Okay. Um, mm -mm, mm -mm. You're not there. You're not there. Uh, mm, mm. Mm, okay, okay. Not there. You're not there. You're here. You're here. Okay. Desire of Ages 439. I want you to put that down as well. I want to look at that. Desire of Ages, page 439. All right. Steps to Christ. I believe it's page 81. We'll see if we'll get there. All right. But I want us to notice now, again, let's keep how, how do we surrender the will, the choice, and the mind to Christ? How, as we said, do we come to an experience where we are willing to lean not, where we're willing to trust in the Lord with not some, but all of the heart. Not most of it, but we're willing to trust him with all of the heart. Now, let's not look at it in this, re re this, this confined religious religion aspect. Let's go to the job. All right. Let's go to the child with the temper tantrum. Um, let's go in the grocery store. Uh, let's go uh, uh, to the person that is, is speaking down to you as though you're a child when you're adult. Let's um, let's go on the job when you know that that promotion is not coming to you uh, uh, because of these peculiar beliefs that you're hanging on to. Okay, let's, let's, let's go to uh, uh, the home, let's go to the relative's home that don't believe like you, that think that you're a little extreme, not only just in the, what you're doing, but in what your children are being raised up to be. Okay, let's, let's go into those environments outside of the church building. All right. Let's deal with the, 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 the unbelieving spouse. All right. And let's, let's go into the space where the, the, the children are starting to pull away. Now they're getting older and they're starting to pull away. Now in that environment, how do we surrender the will and the mind to Jesus. How do we, in that situation, temper tantrum, right? The child is throwing an attitude. The child is speaking to you as though you're the child and they're the adult. All right. The, the spouse is, is questioning your, your, your ability to be a parent. Your, your, your experience is being questioned in that environment. How do we trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. How do we in that environment lean not to our own understanding, but how do we in that environment, uh, um, in, in all of the situations we're doing, we're going to acknowledge his ways because the promise is he will direct our paths, not independent of those steps, trusting in the Lord with all our hearts, leaning not to our own understanding, acknowledging him in all of our ways. And the promise is I'll direct the path, not independent of these three, but he wants to direct. And the problem that we often find is we're looking for direction, but we're not doing our part. And this is one of the things that Margaret Davis in, in the book, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? She brings that out. God's part, man's part. Though our part is immeasurably small to the part of God, it is essential. It is essential. It is essential. 
All right. So not independent of these three steps. Will God direct you in what you need to do? All right. And <clears throat> notice. So here we are in John 1, John 1 and verse 29. John 1 and verse 29. The Bible says, the next day John seeth who? Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Not just the sin as the offense, but by beholding Christ, we are willing to surrender our sympathy for sin. We're willing to surrender our sympathy for sin. Now, what's interesting is, is that in all of these various situations that we highlighted, one may suit you or you may have been in one situation or another. But what happens is in these uh, situations, God wants where by beholding is not just the offense, it's the sympathy with our own understanding. We are too sympathetic with how we feel. And that has come through a lifetime of false education. I'm not dealing with going to a university, I'm not dealing with college and school. No, I'm dealing with how David says we were fashioned born in this thing, fashioned, trained, educated. We, we are too sympathetic with how we feel about a situation and we're not willing to embrace God's remedy because God's remedy may take too long. And by beholding Christ, God removes the, not just the desire for the offense, but he wants to take away our sympathy for the sin. Now, when you look at Christ again, by beholding, right? By beholding, we become changed. And by beholding doesn't mean I'm walking around with the book in front of my face. When we talk about this, uh, um, God's acknowledging him, <clears throat> trusting in him. Let's go back in the beginning in the garden. Let's see Adam, see Eve at the tree. See Eve pondering whether or not she should violate God's principle. God, the parent, what does he do? Does he rush in and save her from her plight? Or does he allow an experience so that she can learn to trust in his everlasting love? Does she allow him to experience so that she can learn to trust in his everlasting love? And a lot of times, brothers and sisters, we are prone to immediately deal with the situation, but we often don't recognize that in this situation, what is God's purpose for this particular strife or situation that I'm in? We were talking, I was talking with the children one day, and we were talking about different things. And, and we went to the text in Proverbs 51, where it says a soft answer will turn away wrath. And so we gave we began to give scenarios and situations of where something would arise and how would, how was our response to be to that? And we use situations that they deal with in their home life and situations of going back and forth with each other or one accusing some of doing something that they did not do or one saying someone did something that they did not do. And it starts a back 
and forth situation. And we showed how in that situation, a soft answer could turn away wrath. And a soft answer doesn't mean lowering the voice and disagreeing. No, you did do it. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. You did do it. No, no, no. You're lying. No, that's, that's not the soft answer we're talking about. When we're looking at the soft answer, the soft answer may be a better choice of words. Did you do this? I didn't do that. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought I saw you do that. Soft answer ends the wrath, ends the conversation. And these are things that we find these ways of escape in the Word of God. These are the ways of escape that we often find in God's Word. Because oftentimes, brothers and sisters, you know, the Bible talks about not provoking our children. And there are many times that we would tell a child no, and we would create a situation of contention, and all of a sudden, both of us, the adult and the child, Pride hits an, a height where there's contention and the, and the parent is wanting the child to surrender. But in this situation, many times we will have to ask ourselves, is no because I'm irritated? Is no because I don't want to be bothered with the situation? Or is no because it is in the child's best interest. And a lot of times we start a contention about things when we don't really think about it. The child asks, and before we think, it's no. And then it comes back, why? Now, should the child submit? Yes. The child has every right and every reason for that child to submit. I have to tell my children, I said, listen, if I ever tell you no, and you understand that maybe I'm just not uh, abreast of the situation clearly, then go to God. Pray about the situation and seek to help me to understand why it is you asked for this particular thing. Don't just accept no. Now, if there's something obvious there that, that will bring harm, accept the no and, and allow time to be a reveal of all secrets. But if you feel that my response of no is hasty and I'm not really abreast of the situation, then it should be prayer and it should be, wow, Lord, give me the tongue of wisdom and make me aware of the situation so that I can see and maybe, wow, I spoke too soon and I can agree with you. But don't just accept the no and even if I'm appearing to be not rational, don't become openly rebellious to create a situation. Realize that the final word is with God and we have to teach our children to commune with God. We have to show them how to hear God's voice. And a lot of times we can help them hear God's voice by pointing things out to them. When they realize something, say, wow, that was the voice of God. Let me tell you why. And you share those experiences with them. When God speaks to you, share those personal testimonies. Recognize when you have done them wrong. And so you're teaching them that they can actually come to you with their faults and there will be no harsh criticisms and that both of you can go to prayer with God. Now, many of us were not raised that way, but if any man would be in Christ, he is a new creature. God will train us to train our children. In many situations, we allow fear to take place. Watch what, I, uh, we'll, we'll get to desire of ages in a moment. I want you to, something I read, notice, go with me to the book of Nehemiah. 
Go with me to Nehemiah. Go with me to Six. Nehemiah. They came to Nehemiah and they wanted Nehemiah to hide himself. They began to spread false reports that Nehemiah was going to be killed and he should run and hide. But I, I want you to focus on what Nehemiah says in um, verse 11. And this is what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah said, and I said, should such a man as I flee, who is there? Who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. Um, he said, verse 13, therefore, he said he was hired that I should be what? Afraid and do so and what? And sin. Nehemiah said, if I were to be afraid, I would be sinning. I wouldn't be showing my faith and confidence in God. If I allow these situations to put me in fear, he said, I'll be sinning. There are many situations that we become, that our doubt leads us to be afraid. Our doubt becomes a way of showing a lack of faith in God. And what we're, why we're showing that lack of faith, or let me say this, another way. We are exemplifying our doubt because we have more confidence in what we can do and less confidence in what God can do. And God will often bring us in situations to let us see that our faith and confidence in him is not perfect. That we lack that divine trust. We lack that faith in God's promises. And so he creates these situations so that we can cast our care upon him. Now the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. But how do we do that? God brings us into situations where we can learn how to trust. He brings us in situations where we will uh, um, uh, 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 lean not to our own understanding. He brings us in situations where we can uh, uh, Trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not to thy own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him. So God creates situations where we can learn to trust him, where we can learn to uh, uh, put our confidence in him and lean not to what we think, but trust to what God has said in these situations. They are promises that God has to meet us in every situation. And when we're manifesting faith in the promises of God, we are exemplifying the righteousness of God. We are exemplifying the righteousness of God. It's something that, brothers and sisters, that has to be a part of the life. It is something that must be seen by those who would look on as they behold the righteousness of God, as they behold our experience of learning to live moment by moment, day by day. Now, I want us to go back. We looked in uh, John 1 where it says, Behold the Lamb of God was taken away the sin. Now remember, all of this is what we read in the book Evangelism where it said, in the book Evangelism, uh, 152, where it says, there are those who are kept from obeying God because of a confusion of ideas. They do not know how to surrender their wills, which is their choice, and their minds to Christ. They want special instructions. Special instructions. And so as we look at the Bible, God is given or God gives special instructions as we go from one lesson to another, from one scene to another, 
God is teaching us how to trust in him with all of our hearts, how not to lean to our own understanding, how to acknowledge him in all of our ways and the direction of our paths. That's God's part. We're looking for the direction when we're not trusting, when we're um, uh, leaning to our own understanding and we're not acknowledging him. We're, we're moving in fear. We're, we're, we're making decisions. We're not, we're not stopping and saying, Lord, um, um, I don't know what to do. And in the meantime, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Wait doesn't mean to be idle. Wait doesn't mean to just be carefree and go on to something else. Waiting is I'm trusting and I'm searching for wisdom as to how to continue to approach and move forward. That's what waiting is. Waiting is not just sitting there. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. No, I'm continually searching and I'm seeking to understand God's ways. And in the meantime, am I trusting? Am I acknowledging him? <clears throat> am I am I trusting in him? Am I uh, uh, putting aside what I think should be done? Am I am I acknowledging him in all of my ways. This is how we learn to trust God as he places us in these situations, not to be rational, but to trust in him. The disciples moving on the boat, Jesus falls asleep, not unmindful of his disciples, but they in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the temper tantrum, from the child, in the midst of the accusing of the family members, in the, in the midst of going through the job situation, in the midst of going through sickness, in the midst of going through some life crisis, in the midst of going through something, we began to focus on the situation because we don't believe we should ignore it. But in doing that, we lose, we lose sight at whose command we've started out in this journey. <clears throat> but we also have to recognize, am I following my own will? Did I jump in this boat of my own accord? Did Jesus bid me to go this way? <clears throat> and so in dealing with the situation, pre-adventure, he did. Pre-adventure, God has led us in the, the way we're going. And as we begin to look at this particular situation that we find ourselves in, all of a sudden, in the midst of this war that we're in, light flashes and we see Christ. Light flashes and we see Christ. And even though our prayer, because remember when the disciples called Jesus, that was prayer. Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Or master, carest thou not that we perish? They were praying and they called out and their prayer showed faith, showed a lack of faith. But God answered them according to their need. And this is where we're told that our need pleads most eloquently in our behalf. Even when the words of our mouth is not in harmony with our need. Praise God, he does that. And all of a sudden, Jesus steps up, calms the situation, and looks and says, Wherefore did thou doubt? And so now, what is God showing us in that lesson of him moving with his disciples? One lesson is, is that we lack the confidence in God that we should have. We allow too many circumstances to ruffle our feathers. Situations irritate us too quickly. We get frazzled too fast. We adopt the fears of others. And this is why we must have to be slow in letting people come to us with their complaints because we adopt the fears of others. 
And then others will have us in board meetings and business meetings, yelling things that we don't even really believe. We ain't even taking the time to just stop and pray. We've just accepted their fears. Why? Because we, uh, they're my brother and they wouldn't lead us astray. And so we go into an argument saying, wait a minute, not listening for God's voice. I'm going in there based off their f- argument. And I don't like them because my friend doesn't like them. My brother doesn't like them. But we haven't stopped to just wait. We haven't stopped to wait. And so God shows us in these situations that we don't trust him like we think we do. We don't trust him like we preach we ought to. And then there's another thing that God shows us is that Christ in humanity spoke to God and he shows us that you and I in the same crisis could have the same faith and same competence. We can, impl- we, can, we can exercise the same faith that Christ had in his father. You and I could have that same faith. Righteousness by faith. Knowing that God has put us on a mission. And if it be the will of God, he will dry up every ocean before he lets us perish because there is a mission God has put us on. That's confidence. That is not, that is not uh, um, uh, uh, cockiness. That's confidence in God. And so our prayers don't have to be like the disciples was in that boat, a lack of faith, but praise God, Jesus answered according to our need and not according to our words. And God has answered us many a times, not according to your words, according to to your need. And so while you're trying to deal with a child and you're trying to deal with the spouse and you're trying to deal with the job and you're trying to deal with these things, you need to deal with Christ because Christ can turn the rivers of water, can turn the hearts of men like the rivers of water. God can turn the heart of your child like the rivers of water. And so as we understand how to behold Christ, We lose our sympathy with our own selfish feelings. We don't have any confidence in the flesh. We don't make provision for the flesh. And so we learn to dwell in God's presence so that uh, uh, a uh, a word, you know, we speak ill-advisedly and all of a sudden the Spirit of God prompt, oh, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you can't go and do that. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That was, no, 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 uh -uh. you can go and do that. We don't give the flesh room to manifest itself. And we learn again to watch Christ. Watch this. Notice what this says in Desire of Ages. Pray that you're still with me. Pray that you're still with me. I don't like to deal with uh, uh, these theological, uh, things, but something we can grab hold of brothers and sisters, something we can grab hold of. It says in desire of ages, page four, three, nine, four, three, nine. It says, I'm dealing with the paragraph says, let the repenting sinner, watch this, let the repenting sinner fix his eyes upon the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And by beholding, watch this, he becomes changed. Wow, that seems simple. Okay, how do I, the question is, how do I behold? Watch this. It says, uh, by beholding, he becomes changed. His fear is turned to joy by beholding. His doubts to hope by beholding. Gratitude springs up by beholding. The stony heart is broken by beholding. A tide of love sweeps into the soul by beholding. Christ is in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. By beholding, when, here it is, 
when we see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, working to save the lost, slighted, scorned, derided, driven from city to city till his mission was accomplished. When we behold him in Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood and on the cross dying in agony, when we see this, here it is, self will no longer clamor to be recognized. Stop for a moment. Could it be that in your dispute with your temper tantrum child, let's say your husband is on a temper tantrum. Let's say someone on the job, let's do, again, bring it into whatever scenario that you often find yourself. Does self clamor to be noticed? You want your child to acknowledge you as the parent. You're going to respect me. Look at me. You're going to cause that person on your job who talks down to you to respect you. You want that person in that lane to know that you were there first. You want that person as you're going to that aisle in the grocery store to know that you were headed there first. Whatever the scenario is, do you clamor at that moment? Why are you irritated? Because self is being slighted. Do you not like talking to people about God because they're going to reject you? I don't like to. Why? Because you don't like to be rejected. It's not about Christ, them not accepting Christ. You just don't like the fact that they won't accept you. That's why. So we have not come to the point in our experience in Revelation 12, where it says they love not their lives unto the death. They overcame by the blood of their testimony. They love not their lives. We're not to that point. And yet, Sunday law is coming. Sunday law is coming. But we're not to that point. We're not to that point in our experience. And yet we're screaming that we're living in the last days. And as the Bible says in the book of Amos, to what day will that be to you? Will it not be darkness? Why do you desire the day of the Lord for? For what? So what happens is, by beholding, I want to read these things to you again. I don't have the slide up, so I want to read it to you again. By beholding, we become changed. The fear, your fear will be turned into joy. By beholding, your doubts into hope. By beholding, gratitude springs up. How? By beholding. The stony heart is broken. By beholding, a tide of love sweeps into the soul. By beholding. It says the stony heart is broken by beholding Christ is in you, a well of water springing up into eternal life. Why? How? Not why, how? By beholding. When you see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with your griefs. You know, brothers and sisters, we can idol, we can make a God out of grieving. We can grieve so much to where we push God out of our presence because we have fallen in love with grief. Why? Because it gives us some sense of worthiness. Because I'm grieving, I'm getting all this sympathy and I've come to look for the sympathy and this grieving now becomes like a drug 
and I'm in, and I'm, and I'm, uh, and I'm in this relationship with grief that I don't like, but Satan is twisting my mind. And we can make a God out of anything, but by beholding joy, the stony heart, all this happens by broken, <clears throat> by beholding. When we see Jesus, it says self, self, the greatest battle that you and I will ever have to fight is the battle against self. That's the greatest battle that you and I will ever have to fight. It's not with the Pope. It's not with the Congress. It's not with the laws of the land. Is it, it is with self. And so, while we are informing the world that we're living in the last days, we must make sure that we are drawing, drawing, drawing them to behold. Because the world's been bitten by the serpent. They've been bitten by the serpent. And the church's been bitten by the serpent. And so while we're pointing, yes, we're living the last days, but brothers and sisters, people are dying. Why? Because they're not looking and living. They don't know how to. They don't know how. So it's a battle now. It's a battle with whether or not you believe you're in the last days or not. It's, it's, we're battling, brothers and sisters. We're fighting. We're, we're, everyone is trying to save themselves. It says... Self will no longer clamor to be recognized. Looking unto Jesus, we shall be ashamed of our coldness, our lethargy. You look that word lethargy up in the early writings that talks about the Laodiceans. We'll be ashamed of our Laodicean condition. We'll be ashamed of our self-seeking. We shall, verse four, page 440, we shall be willing, all right, willing, willing is a choice, willing is the choice. We shall be willing to be anything or nothing. Let's go back to the point. Many want special instruction. Many want to know how to surrender their wills and their mind to Christ. How do they do this, brothers and sisters? It's not a Bible study class. It's not a righteousness by faith seminar. You have to behold Jesus, the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. You have to follow Christ's life. By beholding, you will be changed. That's what you have to do. You have to fall down on your knees before the word of God and say, Lord, open mine eyes that I may behold the wondrous truth in thy law. Like the men that came from, from, from Greece, we would see Jesus. We can say like Mary, Lord, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? And as we read with that intent in the gospel of Genesis, you'll see Jesus. You'll go from Genesis to Exodus and you'll see Jesus. You'll go from Exodus to Numbers and you'll see Christ. You'll go from Numbers to Leviticus from Leviticus to Deuteronomy, from Deuteronomy to Joshua, from Joshua to Judges. And everywhere you go, you will see the footprints of Jesus and you'll just keep following. You'll keep following and you'll be able to see the providence of God, how he's been drawing you, drawing you to himself. And we are told, except to Christ, I believe it's page 21 or 23, that if you do not resist, you will be drawn to him in repentance. You will be drawn to him. He, he's drawing you to himself. And so now, 
as beholding this, you'll be willing. Willing. What is what willing? You will choose. It's a choice. It is a it is a consent of the mind. It's not impulsive. You don't, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm impulsively. No, no, no. You're not impulsive. It's a choice. Regardless of what your impulse is, you have to make a decision. Righteousness is not impulsive. It's decision making. But you will have an impulse to do and choose what is right. Because it is right. Not because doing right will bring you some favor. Doing right may get you hung on a cross. Doing right may get you in the lion's den. Doing right may get you persecuted. Doing right will get you put out. But you're doing right because it is right and it's not about you. That's what doing right will do. But many of us, brothers and sisters, are not bothered with doing right. We're bothered with how we look. We're not willing to accept loss in anything. We work for it. We want it. We can't get it. We'll go to the streets and fight for it. We'll even pray that God will smite with the fist of wickedness so we can have it. And we will use Bible texts and spirit of prophecy quotes to justify ungodliness. But brothers and sisters, as the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. What we justify down here among each other has nothing to do with what God sees in those books. We can ignore and we can do, we, we, we can come up with any excuse we want, but God is not fooled by our half-heartedness. I want to close. I want to look at close. Notice what it says. We shall be willing to be anything or nothing. So that we may do, here it is, have mercy, hard service for the master. We shall rejoice, it says, to bear the cross after Jesus. To endure trial, shame, or, or persecution for his dear sake. Desire of Ages 439, 440. The chapter is, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? I want to look at something very quickly in Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ, page 47. Brothers and sisters, I'm, oh, I wish we can, uh, uh, I said we want to get into a study in the book Christ Object Lessons. It's just that time, time is going to be a, uh, a lengthy study. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to breeze, I'm not going to cover everything. I can't cover everything in the book Christ Object Lessons. But we there, there's some things that we in in, in time time uh, there are too many uh, uh, things that's going on that will cause us to go and break and go and break. So we have to get some time where we can just have and we could just actually go through it. I'm reading from Steps of Christ, page 47. It's taken from the book Steps of Christ, chapters consecration. It says it says many many. Many are acquiring, how shall I make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power. Let's, let's bring in all of the scenarios we talked about. In all of those scenarios, you're weak. You get around family members who you know don't believe, who you know uh, they may call themselves Adventists, they may call themselves whatever, but they don't believe the Word of God the way you do. They don't subscribe to your fanatical extreme views when it comes to your children, when it comes to diet, when it comes to your choice of, 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 of what they call entertainment and what you call rec true recreation. They don't subscribe to those ideas. And so, when you get around them, they begin to say certain things and all of a sudden you become weak and you don't want to tell your child no because you don't want to offend them. You know, they are playing with a video game with guns and, and violence and you want to tell your child no, but you don't want 
to offend them because then that makes their child looks like look like they're not doing something right. So you're weak in moral power in that situation. You're in the church and and yes, you're 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 in the business meeting or you're on the board meeting and you don't want to seem fanatical, but but you don't agree with what's being done. You know, you don't you don't agree with the teachers that are being selected, but, you know, God's got it. And, you know, this is his church. He'll fix it. You know, you don't read that in the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, however, but you're weak in moral power. You just you just going to sit and you're going to bite your lip. And although you see your children being influenced negatively, you find some way to justify the compromise. And the reason why is because you're weak in moral power. You don't know how to say no. You see that this is not helping your children, but you're not, but you're going to continue to push and it, you're weak in moral power. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. We have to recognize our poverty of soul. We're weak, but God will give us strength. So the question is, how do I surrender? I'm weak in moral power in slavery to doubt. I'm controlled by habits, by the habits of a life of sin. My promises and my resolutions, they end by January 19th. Um, I, I, I can't control my thoughts. And the reason why I can't control them is because I'm constantly listening and watching things that are constantly feeding the negative. They're constantly feeding the flesh. This is why I can't control them because I'm, I'm like a fountain, uh, 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 not a fountain, but I'm like, uh, um, I'm unstable. I'm like Reuben. I'm, 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 I don't know what to do. And this is why we're not able to. It says you can't control your thoughts, your impulse, your affections, the knowledge of your broken promises, forfeited pledges, weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair, brothers and sisters. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends upon the right action, the power of choice. God has given men. It is there to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. Then he will then work in you both to will and to do of his good nature. I want to leave this last part of his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Then it says our desire for goodness. That's fine. But if they stop here, if you just desire something, but don't choose it, desires are, they, they don't work. This is, is good for nothing. The desire must become action. You must make a choice. But why would you choose someone you don't know? Why would you choose to live with someone you don't know? Brothers and sisters, we have to know him. We have to know him. And I pray that we would take the opportunities that God is providing for us to know him. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this brief time together. Lord, I pray that you would work in us. We thank you for your drawing power. We're thankful for the conviction of sin. Help us to see sin for what it is. It is an enemy to our souls. It destroys our peace. It deceives. Wash us. 
And may we, by beholding, experience all that we have read. And may we testify to your faithfulness. Forgive us of our doubting and our unbelief. Forgive us of our love affair with ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.